All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Network 2020's briefing about international finance institutions and their role in today's world. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Network 2020 is a New York City-based nonprofit, and we provide access to leading thinkers and doers in international affairs for our audiences in New York and around the world. And we're really trying to create more nuanced conversations about global affairs. Um, so with that, um, we're going to talk today about institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which have long been pillars of global economic stability and development since the post-World War II era. Um, However, or since the World War II era, however, because there are critics that argue that they are not able to effectively address contemporary challenges and that changing geopolitical dynamics has further complicated matters. So to make sense of IFIs, international finance institutions in today's world, I am pleased to have two terrific experts and a moderator today to take us through what the role of IFIs are today, what reforms might be needed, and what are some of the different perspectives on these questions. So first, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dauda Semben. Uh, Dr. Semben is the founder and CEO of Africatalyst, a global development advisory based in Dakar, Senegal. He is affiliated with the Washington-based Center for Global Development as a distinguished non-resident fellow. He was an executive director of the International Monetary Fund, where he represented 23 African countries on the executive board. And during his IMF board tenure, he chaired the statutory board committee that was tasked with strengthening collaboration at the board level between the IMF and other inter international institutions like the World Bank, UN, and World Trade Organization. He has also served as senior economic advisor to the president of Senegal. And it is also my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ben Steele. Dr. Steele is a senior fellow and director of the International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He is the lead writer of the Council's Geographics Economics blog and the creator of eight web-based interactives tracking global monetary policy, global imbalances, global growth, global trade, global energy, sovereign risk, China's Belt and Road, and central bank currency swaps. Prior to joining the Council in 1999, he was director of the International Economics Program at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House in London. And the conversation will be moderated by Network 2020 board member James Upton, who has worked in emerging markets countries for many years as an economist and strategist. He spent the past 17 years as Chief Strategic Officer for Emerging Market Equities at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. He has an MA in Economics and U.S. Foreign Policy from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So with that, welcome the three of you, and it is my pleasure to introduce, to turn the forum over to James. Thank you, Courtney, and uh, thank you, Dr. Semben and Dr. Steele for joining us uh, with such experts. I wish we had two hours, but I think we're going to have to schedule an additional uh, an additional webinar another day to go over so many things we'd love to discuss today. And we have an auspicious scheduling for this, uh, no eclipse distracting us as far as we know. And depending on how the conversation goes, no earthquakes that we're aware of. Um, why don't I start with Dr. Steele? Uh, and I think it would help set the tone for our, uh, participants in this webinar if we, if you could sort of explain to the participants and uh, just how the governance of these two institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, function and why it's in the U.S. interest for them to, uh, why it's in the U.S. interest to support these organizations. In short, why do these institutions matter? Okay. With regard to the way it, the, the organizations are governed today, I'll defer to Dauda on, on that one because he's, he's actually been in the seats. But in terms of the way the institutions were created, um, uh, late in World War II in um, uh, 1944, um, uh, it's important to recognize that um, they play very different roles today. Um, the IMF, um, uh, for example, was meant to ensure that um, uh, some form of multilateral trading um, regime could be revived um, after World War II. Um, and in order to do that, interestingly enough, rather than trying to start with a new trade regime, 
you know, GATT didn't come until um, many years um, uh, later, which would get, eventually became the WTO, they decided to work on monetary issues first and ensure that countries that got into balance of payments difficulties would not for that reason start imposing um, uh, trade barriers, that there would be some international mechanism to provide short-term support. Um, but it's very important to recognize that the IMF we see today, which is first and foremost a, a financial firefighter, a, a, a crisis institution, that was not envisioned at all in um, 1944. Um, in, in fact, um, both the, the, the British and the Americans who really had warred in, uh, between each other for two years in the run up to the conference, very much agreed that countries that ultimately found themselves in real um, uh, financial difficulty paying their bills um, would have to take care of it on their own, basically by devaluing their currency. So this was a, a, a time at which fixed exchange rates were the accepted norm. You know, fast forward um, uh, to today, after the collapse of fixed exchange rates in the early 1970s, the liberalization of capital flows in the 1980s, um, what you, you, you found was that um, countries were continuously coming to the IMF for, for, for crisis um, um, support. Um, so it is a very, very different institution today. You could say the same thing at the World Bank in 1944, the way it was envisioned at the US Treasury was that it would um, help in the reconstruction of war-torn Europe after the Second World War. And uh, the Latin American nations, um, for quite under, understandable reasons, uh, objected to that. They said, they said, you know, why should our hard-earned dollars go to um, uh, reconstructing war damage in rich states? Um, how is this going to be used to our benefit? So the idea of um, re so giving the uh, World Bank an, an, another mission um, a development was sort of tacked on quite late in the process in order to satisfy the Latin Americans. Fast forward today, and um, uh, the, the World Bank is a, a, a major development organization, and basically nobody remembers its roots as a war reconstruction um, uh, organization. Um, the one important thing to notice about governance within the two institutions, and I definitely like to hear Dowda's thoughts on this in terms of how it works today, is that the United States has a quite unique role in both organizations and that it has sole veto power over major policy decisions. And it was created quite consciously in that way. Um, if we were going to create um, uh, an, an IMF and a World Bank today, it would be inconceivable that the United States could demand such a privilege um, uh, for itself. And that naturally produces some tensions with other um, uh, countries who have become very much active and necessary participants in the, uh, these organizations. Great. Um... So maybe uh, I'll turn to Dr. Semben and saying, um, you know, among your many accomplishments in your career, you spent 17 years at the IMS, so you're a practitioner, you know, a practitioner, participant. What are you seeing as some of the challenges today that some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, member countries are facing as a result of the competition between the U.S. and China? And we should preface it, I think we all know this just from our general reading, that when the IMF and the World Bank were founded, of course, the beginnings of the so Cold War were there with the rival with the Soviet Union from a geopolitical and military or from a military perspective. But the Soviet Union was never an economic competitor of the US. And today we have the situation of China not only being a geopolitical and military competitor, but an aspirational economic great power, number two economy in the world with aspirations to become the number one economy. So of course that has inherent conflicts. And so for Dr. Semben, how do you see some of that rivalry or competition between the US and China affecting sort of members' interests and, and, and what they'd like to see change? 
Well, thank you very much, James. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, maybe before I respond to your question, I'm going to a little bit touch upon the first question you asked uh, Ben, and um, uh, which he deferred to me about how the governance of these institutions, the IMF and the World Bank functions. Uh, first of all, what you have to know is those two organizations represent about 190 countries around the world. So it's almost virtual uh, uh, sort of all the members, all the countries around the world are members of those two institutions. And in terms of how it works, you have three type of um, sort of uh, entities or organs in within the institution. You have the board of directors, which is, of course, uh, at the World Bank includes 25 um, executive directors who are representing the 190 countries. And at the IMF, you have 24 executive directors representing all those 190 countries. Basically, what should have happened is um, above them, there is what they call the board of uh, governors, which is composed of um, uh, ministers and central bank governors that actually, according to the IMF articles of agreement, are in charge of uh, governing the IMF and the World Bank. But what happened, uh, I'm sorry, governing the IMF, but what happened is they delegate that authority to the board of directors that I talked about. So the second type of um, um, uh, uh, actors you have within those institutions is management. So the board of the IMF and the board of the World Bank are chaired by the by management. So at the IMF is the managing director and at the World Bank is the president of the World Bank. So, and the third actor that you have in both organization is what they call the staff, the staff members who are in charge of operations. So just to quickly also refer to what uh, Ben talked about, about the US having a veto power. What happened is if you go to the IMF, most of the most important decisions are taken at the majority of 85 uh, percent of, uh, of uh, total votes and the u.s at this stage has about 16 more than 16 percent of the voting power which means of course that if the u.s doesn't agree with any major decision of course that decision would not be taken by the board of the director so maybe now to respond to your question i think uh, i think um, the essence is that what are those challenges that institutions like the imf and the world bank face today and also how these challenges are complicated by the rivalry between the US and uh, China. So let me first of all actually talk about one key uh, challenge that the both institutions are, are sort of facing right now. And I think it's referred to uh, what uh, Ben talked about earlier, is the governance system. So you, here you are, you have uh, two institutions who were created eight years ago this year. Of course, when they were created, they were created with what was going on at that time, and also with a governance system that actually was supposed to reflect the reality of uh, the world 80 years ago. But now, if fast forward, if you're looking at the world right now, it's totally different from what happened uh, at that time. So I think the key challenge that both of these organizations are facing is now how to make sure that uh, their governance reflects the evolution of uh, the world and the world reality as they are today. So you take, for instance, the uh, the IMF. Well, the IMF has a governance system that makes that sort of attribute voting power in relation to the economic sort of um, uh, uh, importance of the countries. So right now you're in a situation where China maybe 80 years ago was not that important, but right now it has you know, it's now the second uh, world economy after the U.S. And unfortunately, its uh, um, uh, voting power hasn't evolved to catch up. So those are key issues that the IMF and the World Bank have to have to sort of uh, struggle with. Uh, and I think the issue is, of course, this is very complicated when you have a, a competition between the U.S. and the China who address those issues because of course as you know congress would never uh us congress would make would find it very difficult of course to agree with reform that would uh, favor china uh, at this stage that's one another uh, key uh, challenge that these two institutions are facing is how to revisit their business models so you have a business model of course that uh, you know date back many decades ago and now that's maybe um are not necessarily sort of uh, in line with expectations from some members. So you take many developing countries, they would tell you that the, the, the World Bank and the IMF has very limited risk tolerance. So when they lend to those countries, they actually add a number of safeguards. And one of the key safeguards is what is called the conditionality. It's of course, when the IMF and the World Bank provide resources to those countries, they tell them, well, you will get 
part of these resources only if you implement or this type of policies or this type of actions. So those sometimes are found to be very intrusive by some of those uh, recipients or borrowers. So I think this is something that, of course, reflect the fact that they, they need to be looked at and, of course, adapted. Uh, one other issue is when those organizations were created, uh, you take the World Bank, for instance, the mandate was to help address and reduce poverty and also, of course, uh, sort of address inequality. Mm -hmm. But right now, the membership of the World Bank has found that it is important also that the World Banks looked at uh, issues about the delivery of uh, global public goods, which means that they will need to adapt and update their, the mandate of the World Bank to reflect that, uh, that type of uh, expectation. So that's another issue also that is uh, faced. So maybe not to be too long, I think one other um, critical challenge that the both uh, the IMF and the World Bank are facing is what is called voice and representation. So you take uh, the example of Africa. So I told you, for instance, that, that the IMF has 24 executive directors and the World Bank 25. At the IMF, out of, out of those 24 executive directors, only two are from Sub-Saharan Africa. So those two uh, represent a combined of four or six countries. So each of them representing 23. I was one of them I, when I used to be at the, at the IMF executive board, I was representing 23 of those countries. So you compare that with a number of other executive directors that are representing only one country. So of course, uh, the one representing the US is only looking after the US. The one represent, uh, uh, representing Germany is only looking after Germany. Even China, the one looking at China is only representing China. Same with uh, Saudi Arabia, same with France, same with the UK. So so what I'm saying here is I think many countries, and it's not only in Africa, but also in, um, in the Middle East or also in Latin America, feel like uh, there is a need to make sure that uh, that issue is also addressed so that, you know, the board is representing more, of course, or, um, it's sort of they have more seat at the board. Right now, the IMF is looking at the ways to add a third seat for sub-Saharan African countries, which the World Bank already did uh, years ago. So finally, I think uh, what I would add to what I just said is what really make it, and I, I think I, this, I say that at the US Congress when I was uh, uh, testifying, is that I think this competition between US and China is of course uh, likely to complicate um, these challenges that I just talked about, how to reform the governance, how to make sure that there is better sort of um, business model, et cetera. And because it is, uh, it undermines the legitimacy and of course the effectiveness of these institutions um, as perceived from developing countries, but it also has the potential to paralyze their operations and their decision making. So I think this is the reason why uh, it needs to hopefully to be as as constructive as it is possible to 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 uh, to help uh, avoid this uh, or address these challenges. Thank you so much. And maybe Dr. Steele, if you could build on that a bit with that core idea of what does the U.S. do when, in fact, China is some of these reforms would give China more power within an institution within both institutions at a time when, as we know, it's it's a bipartisan popular thing to do to challenge China at every level, uh, let alone uh, trade issues, but in almost every other, in every other weir, every other sphere. Well, the, the last major episode um, of governance reform at the, the two institutions came during the Obama administration um, when it was proposed to um, uh, have new voting weights, which would have left in place the U.S. veto power and sole veto power, basically would have given China in particular more say, um, but mainly at the expense of the old European powers. Um, so the United States looking at this from a, a rational, realist, selfish perspective should have, in, in my view, should have embraced this Im immediately. It was no threat whatsoever to um, uh, the dominant U.S. Um, voice at the two institutions. Instead, um, uh, Congress sat on it for years. Um, and this had, in my view, and I, I definitely like to hear uh, Dauda's um, uh, view on this, gave China the opportunity to go around the world and say, look, we tried to be reasonable with these people, but they're not um, uh, reasonable. That's why we need to set up new institutions that, for example, can contribute to infrastructure development in, um, in Asia. 
Um, and so uh, two initiatives I'd like to discuss coming from um, China. One, a multilateral institution, the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment um, Bank. I would argue that they would not have gotten nearly as much Western support as they did had Congress embraced that governance reform early on. I should emphasize that eventually it was um, uh, it was um, uh, pushed through um, uh, owing to the efforts of um, uh, Paul Ryan in uh, Congress. I give him a lot of um, credit for that, but it was too too little, too late in my view. There was a lot of um, uh, concern expressed at the time that AIIB would be used to pursue um, uh, Chinese objectives um, and not broad world development direct um, um, uh, 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 objectives. It's probably too early to have a, a serious evaluation, but there are signs of that that I consider concerning. Um, Dauda probably remembers last year the Canadian um, Director General in charge of global communications at AIIB resigned, um, uh, accusing China of um, uh, uh, allowing the organization to be dominated by quote unquote Communist Party hacks. And Canada thereafter ceased all cooperation with um, AIIB. Um, but of far more concern in the United States has been China's massive um, uh, unilateral Belt and Road um, uh, mm -hmm. lending initiative in which China has become by far the, the world's dominant um, creditor for um, development financing, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars um, dedicated to building infrastructure, mostly in the developing world, but infrastructure that's of key interest to China. Um, I don't want to, you know, dominate the discussion on this, but let me just give you one example of um, uh, the sort of concerns that have uh, come out of this. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative initiative financed a large uh, port development in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, that port was not financially successful. Sri Lanka was unable to repay back the loan. And under the terms of the loan, China took over the port um, under a 99-year lease. Um, and naturally, this led to charges from all over the world, particular, particularly from the United States. That, and China was engaged in, de in debt diplomacy and was in, uh, in, in effect participating in a new form of colonialism. Um, this initially sparked a reaction in the United States that was um, emphasizing the need for the US to do the same thing that China was doing. We needed our own Belt and Road. I thought that was a terrible idea at the time. Um, I think we do need um, um, to, to uh, emphasize the traditional multilateral development um, uh, model that the World Bank has um, pursued. And I would emphasize that it is in the US interest to pursue these initiatives through the um, World Bank. First and foremost, as we've already discussed, the United States has unique power within the World Bank having sole um, uh, veto power, meaning no, pro ser no serious project can go forward without US support. And furthermore, even though the United States is the, the most important single creditor at the United States, most of the financing is coming from the rest of the world. So basically, the United States is in this very privileged position of being able to um, finance its own priorities um, uh, with the support of others with, with something, a privilege we would not have, obviously, if we would uh, engaging in these um, uh, uh, initiatives um, unilaterally. So I would like to see um, far more um, financial support for the uh, World Bank. Again, not just in the interest of the developing world, which needs um, uh, financing, but in the in in the, uh, long term strategic U.S. interest as well. And maybe Dr. Simon, you could build on that with some specific uh, examples of like what we've seen go on in the ground on countries within uh, the African continent, where arguably it was 
one could argue the challenge of China becoming a more significant creditor uh, has potentially spawned the U.S. and the West to do more, right? I mean, a lot of these countries, when the when the World Bank and IMF were founded, uh, a lot of the countries in Africa were still colonies of European powers. So now they're, and have been for many, many decades, established countries, but there's been a need for infrastructure development. There's been a need for projects. There's been a need for lending. And one could argue to flip it on its head that China's aggression in that regard with Belt and Road has actually spawned you know, sort of spawn the rest of the world, the U.S. and West to say, oh, well, what, you know, maybe we need to do more. So so could you talk, Dr. Simben, about the experience of some member countries and participants in um, what they've experienced with China as a creditor? Because I think we've all read that some of the lending is usurious or predatory, as you point out with the Sri Lanka port, you know, assets can be seized. And I think the other issue where, you know, every country in the world wants to see employment levels increase China often has the practice of bringing in its own workers for infrastructure projects. Could you talk about the experience of some of the specific countries and members? Yeah, definitely, James. I fully agree with uh, what Ben was saying. I think uh, what also is happening, and before I respond to your question, is that it's by the U.S. of course blocking this type of uh, governance reforms or not agreeing to it at the least. Uh, what is happening is, of course, it's damaging also the credibility of the organization because this organization, the IMF and the World Bank, have long tied themselves as being rule-based organization, which means that these are concrete formula that the, they had for uh, uh, defining the voting power of countries. And certainly those formula are not necessarily, of course, applied anymore. And of course, it, uh, in the developing world, this, of course, sort of uh, damages the credibility of those organizations. And that's why I was saying for the effectiveness. But now to respond to your question, I think what uh, a lot of countries or um, particularly in Africa, of course, uh, would really uh, uh, tell you is, yeah, there is a lot of criticism about China uh, going into Africa, into other developing countries like uh, Sri Lanka, as uh, Ben was saying, and uh, sort of um, uh, uh, funding some sort of infrastructure there. Uh, from the perspective of many countries in the developing world, this is very much welcome. Because for them, I think what has happened is China has filled a gap that many advanced economies were not filling when they needed it the most. And many, uh, the World Bank and the IMF didn't also feel when they needed. So uh, it, as you know, for the past several years, there has been a marked drop in the uh, uh, official development assistance for, uh, for uh, countries in Africa and other part of the world. Uh, and at the same time, we have seen, of course, an important sort of um, uh, demand for social demand for um, across all of those countries for infrastructure development, for social spending, and et cetera. Unfortunately, those countries did not feel like they were able to get enough from either their traditional partners, whether it's the US or some other European countries, or from the market. Whenever the African countries were to go to the global market, to the European market, they would be paying maybe, I think, uh, on average, 700 or 800 basis point more than the risk-free interest rate that, uh, the, the, that is the US um, treasury bill. So, in, under those circumstances, when China came, I think many countries felt like uh, this was really sort of uh, very much welcome, especially the Belt and Road initiatives. And of course, people also welcome the fact that it led not only the US, but many other the G7 to come up with some uh, sort of uh, new um, uh, uh, initiative. So I think the you all know that the partnership for global infrastructure and, uh, invest, uh, and investment is a sort of a response by the G7 to the, the Belt and Road Initiative. From the perspective of developing countries, this is much welcome because at the end of the day, the way I think many of these officials in those countries see it is they have so much uh, sort of needs. If you take a country, for instance, if you take a, a, um, a Africa, for instance, um, it is estimated that they would need at least two trillion dollars in terms of just to be able uh, to, to to meet the climate finance need that they have by 2030. So under those circumstances, I think having more sort of uh, partners coming and uh, chipping in, whether they is China or uh, you know the U.S. or European countries, is much welcome. There is some room for working together and making sure that uh, they help address the uh, the needs that those countries have. But I think one something important, and it is in relation to the IMF and the World Bank, is there has been a perceived failure by the World Bank uh, 
uh, particularly to really come up with the, the the financing that those countries needed to inf to, to 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 invest in infrastructure. The World Bank a little bit backtracked in when it came to sort of in, uh, financing infrastructure in many countries. And of course, since those countries, many of them didn't have access to uh, to the to the private capital market. The world they they didn't have any other sort of alternative but to go to China. Now the question is this: there is a lot of criticism about um, you know uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, when I was at the Congress, I think there was certainly bipartisan criticism of uh, uh, China's uh, involvement in many uh, developing countries, particularly in Africa. Some of this criticism is much uh, justified, of course, because you know there are some um, uh, Chinese entity, particularly some private. Chinese entity that would land, um, you know, at market condition or sometimes even actually, uh, you know, uh, more unfavorable conditions. But you should not also, and I think that's the perspective that many developing countries do have, is China also has a lot of good sense. First of all, they do uh, provide cheap lending. Uh, particularly some public entities, they can provide concessional funding, just like at the World Bank. Uh, some others also, they may be, of course, um, uh, helping with white elephants, but there are also a lot of good um, infrastructure and concrete infrastructure that have an impact on growth in many developing countries that China, of course, has helped build. Um, uh, I think this is something that uh, also needs to be kept in mind. I can give you my own example. I'm from Senegal. And I live about 50 miles away from uh, from from uh, from downtown where I work. Uh, it used to be that to uh, to drive from uh, my home to downtown, it would take you at least three hours. Well, uh, what happened is uh, with the help of China, there has been, a, and not only China only, but also with France, there has been a new toll road that has been uh, sort of uh, constructed. Now it takes me only half of this time to get to, to, to work. So what I'm saying is not everything is bad about China. And that's how people, of course, see it. That's how officials in Africa and elsewhere also see it. I think the question is more how really uh, all the partners, whether it's traditional or non-traditional, could get together, especially at the IMF and the World Bank, to make sure that at least they can support the members, the developing members, in their best of their ability. And I believe, and I repeat it, this is something that I said at the at the um, uh, at, at Congress. I think constructive engagement, at least within the BWIs, uh, the World Bretton Woods institution uh, between the I, uh, between the US and China, would certainly very much help um, those developing countries meet their needs and i believe this is something that uh, hopefully will be um, heard um, going forward uh, dr seal do you want to add anything to that or i would just briefly piggyback on um, what dauda was mentioning in terms of climate financing um mm -hmm. the, the the whole world has an enormous incentive to make sure that de development um uh in uh, emerging markets um is done in a climate friendly way um and so the world bank i think plays a critical role now in ensuring that um uh, development financing um uh in the um uh, emerging world is done in a way that does not contribute to um climate change um, and we should not expect that to be a, a, a Chinese priority, but it should be a priority for the in, in, entire globe and the World Bank in particular should reflect that. Mm -hmm. And maybe I found it interesting to see that <clears throat> lately we have, you know, over the years, and I <clears throat> worked very closely with Latin America as a strategist <clears throat> for many, many years and spent a lot of time in the countries. As we know, you know, you have countries like Argentina that are sort of perpetually troubled um, and going to the IMF and you can, you know, the opposition party, the Peronistas can launch a, a massive demonstration against IMF uh, sort of impositions. And yet today you're seeing a very interesting phenomenon. And I asked this of both of you phenomenon going on where countries like Argentina, Egypt, Kenya, Nigeria, even Turkey, who would have thought Erdogan would be would be doing this, but suddenly countries, because of market forces requiring it, because they want to see investment in their countries and they want to revive growth in their economies, they're actually following the old Washington consensus, the old traditional IMF standards of trying to have a more balanced fiscal budget, uh, letting your currency float, even if that means devaluing uh, 
you know, paying attention to to debt issues. How much of this is uh, just the sort of marketplace at work and people realizing there's competition to attract capital to your country, whether it's in equities or, or fixed income or whatever form, direct investment? Uh, and how much is maybe that we're realizing, well, in fact, the IMF has had good advice on these issues, um, uh, uh, on these sort of, you know, economic practices. Uh, I I throw that out to you both. As should I go first? Sure. sure. Yeah. No, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, what it says is that um, countries um, uh, in the developing world are very much willing to take, to make the sort of extra efforts to uh, to meet their uh, their development needs to attract investors from uh, you know um, um, from um, from um, richer countries so basically you when you look at it and you look at some imf report you will see that most of these countries have very much tried over the past several years to um, reform their way out of um, sort of uh, poverty and then um, they have been at the time the the world bank used to have the doing business indicators and basically whenever the every year the the, the there was a uh, some uh, ranking of the best performers. There was a lot of African countries and also developing countries. So what it shows is there is really an appetite for uh, sort of doing the right reform. Some of them was, of course, in line with the Washington consensus, although it's not everything. Um, but at the same time, I think um, what you have seen now is they are very much trying to take, of course, the lead when it comes to uh, you know the debate over what should be the reform um, the, of the global uh, international sort of um, economic system. So look at this. Um, when, for instance, the IMF and the World Bank was were created back in um, uh, 1944, there were only three African countries that were among the founding members. So it was Ethiopia, Egypt, and uh, and South Africa. The rest of the countries right now, those two, um, uh, those two organizations have uh, among their members all African countries, all the 54 countries. All of those countries actually joined after they became independent uh, in the late 50, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. So what it says is since then we have seen those countries actually sort of growing, although they are still facing with a lot of uh, challenges. You can see that for the past. Um, Africa now is, if you take Africa collectively, the 54 countries, and if they were uh, one country, they would be uh, maybe about the seventh or eighth um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, largest economy. Uh, uh, what it tells you, because right now Africa last year uh, was a tri trillion dollars economy, uh, and now it is estimated that in the next five years it will be a four trillion dollars economy. What it says is, as uh, you know, the continent gain sort of economic sort of uh, 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 power, they also expect to be also more uh, present in the decision making of the of the uh, of uh, uh, in, in the world. So I think that's why it was very much welcome that the G20 decided to allocate a seat at the African Union. And I think that's something that uh, certainly very much is much welcome. And that's also show how African countries and developing countries in general uh, are very much willing to change actually the way uh, the, the global uh, economic system is working because some of them feel like it is leaving them behind and i think if you take the also outside africa most emerging market uh, starting with the BRICS, also have this feeling that they also needs to be on the uh, you know at the decision table given the fact that they have really gained uh, economic importance uh, over the past uh, several years so i think these are issues that needs to be taken into account so that uh, you know and take the most out of it to make sure that these um, institution the imf and the world bank are really reform in a timely manner so countries do not have to go and look for alternative uh, sort of uh, alternatives and uh, these institutions if they are very much well used they can very much do a good job at making sure that really they support the global economic system they support multilateralism but they should do it in a way that uh, really um, is considered to be fair a sort of a representative and inclusive um, uh, governance system otherwise i think countries are as ben was saying earlier are going to look for alternative like the aaib and other organizations that were set up uh, recently. Dr. Steele, could you could you build on that a little bit? Yeah, if I could unfairly use my time to to put put two questions back to Dauda. Uh, 
from from you know putting yourself back on your your old perch at the IMF how you deal with two particular problems that recur um take a country like Argentina Argentina's debt to the IMF is now 43 billion dollars it's difficult to imagine that's ever going to be repaid since the IMF operates as a bank and it needs to to get its money back um naturally it imposes conditionality on its loans um, but th that conditionality, the policies behind the conditionality make those governments unpopular in those countries. They eventually fall. A new government emerges, comes back to Washington and says, well, you shouldn't have loaned money to those corrupt idiots. They didn't know what they were doing. They were never going to follow through. Now you have to lend us money to clean up all the problems that you and those corrupt idiots created. How do you get out of that cycle? Second, with regard to, to China, Pakistan. Pakistan has a huge debt now, and of course is, is, has been coming to the IMF for help. And there must be enormous frustration within the IMF because the member states say, well, you borrow tens of billions of dollars from China, okay? And you can't pay, pay back um, uh, that debt. This, you need to deal with your primary creditor, that is um, uh, China. Um, it's you and China who created this problem. You shouldn't be coming to us before um, uh, you and uh, China clean that up. How does that triangular um, uh, uh, conflict ultimately resolve itself? Well, it's an it's a, it's a extremely tricky question because I, I think you're right in the sense that the IMF has a pool of, reserve, of resources that, that, you know, is available to all of its members. So whenever a member is, uh, you know, is in need, the IMF, it is the uh, sort of um, um, the obligation or the, uh, uh, the IMF that should be coming as a lenders of a last resource. So, of course, it has to be, uh, it has to provide the resources that it gets in a way that does not necessarily, of course, uh, create some... Uh, uh, some um, sort of um, um, issues in terms of uh, repayment and other. So, but you have to risk, you have to distinguish two type of resources that the IMF has. So you have those non concessional resources that are like uh, the lending that the IMF can do without subsidizing, and so at the rates that are sort of uh, high enough for the IMF not to be sort of uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, you know not to lose its money. From the other type of resources, which is the subsidized lending that the IMF gives to poor countries or uh, developing countries, I think in the second part, I mean, the type of the subsidized uh, resources that we are talking about, there there is a case, of course, for having some limits because those are scarce resources. Although people would tell you that you should be able also to find enough the subsidy resources to really grow the pie of uh, concessional funding. But in any case, I think it really makes sense that uh, you have to add, have some limits to uh, accessing those type of uh, cheap lending because the IMF doesn't have many of it. But I think for the other type, maybe I think the question should be how to make sure that the IMF has a, a lending power, uh, you know, that is very much enough to help those countries that need it whenever they need it. So now to come back to those um, countries that you talked about, whether it's Argentina or uh, sort of um, uh, Pakistan, uh, my sense is the IMF, of course, should continue to have to, to implement the policies that they have. The IMF has very stringent um, sort of policies that um, it's subject to any type of um, uh, uh, a member or country that wants to resource uh, to borrow money from the IMF. First of all, you have to have what is called, um, um, you know, your debt has to be sustainable. So there is a framework that the IMF also, of course, um, sort of apply to countries that borrow to make sure that they can repay uh, and that their debt is sustainable. But on the other hand, also, they should be able to repay actually whatever they, they borrow from the IMF. Those um, sort of um, uh, uh, framework needs to be implemented in in a, in a full manner, in a way that does not actually sort of um, uh, um, um, jeopardize IMF resources. And I think and this is not the big issue that many countries, I mean, if you're not talking about the Argentina or Pakistan, many developing countries are in a situation where they can easily repay if they borrow from the IMF or from the World Bank, but they unfortunately do not get enough resources from those institutions. Why? Because if you take an organization like the IMF, one key issue is it usually lends 
um, uh, 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 to any country in proportion of the quota that the country has, which means that if you were a small um, in, uh, developing countries in Africa with a quota of less than $4 million, well, the IMF would tell you that the limit that you can get, let's assume, is 200% uh, of your quota. Well, you can only borrow four, uh, eight million. I'm just making up some numbers here, but that's how it works. It's like uh, there is a business model that um, sort of tie IMF lending to the quota of the countries that actually benefit from it. Uh, and of course, it might favor countries with a big quota, but unfortunately, countries that have low quota may find it very difficult to get enough resources from the IMF or from the World Bank. And when this happens, um, unfortunately, they tend to go and look for alternatives. And unfortunately, those alternatives are not always the best. So the question should be how to make sure, first of all, that the IMF and the World Bank have enough resources, using actually even sometimes internal resources, but also reducing the their very high uh, uh, degree of uh, risk tolerance. I think if we do that, and second, we make sure that they really actually face limited uh, pressure and interference when they when they are lending in countries like uh, high profile countries. Because at the end of the day, when the IMF decide to lend, it's the board of the IMF that decide that this is good to lend. So the board of the IMF is all the membership, is all the 190 countries that make that common decision to say, well, let's lend to the Argentina because what Argentina is uh, showing and bringing on the table is reassuring let's blend to pakistan so what i'm saying there is is not the you know something that uh, really the countries uh, uh, the borrowing countries have to be blamed but also you have to look at who is making the decision at the board of the imf well that's usually a consensual decision that requires at least uh you know um, the majority of uh, votes so i think that's a cool thing that we need to look at and not maybe try to see whether those countries that are borrowing are at fault or the IMF at fault, but maybe if we reform um, the IMF, the way uh, many uh, countries are um, putting it on the table, and the G20 itself also uh, talking about those reform of the MDBs like the World Bank and the IMF, I think if we do so, maybe we will be in a better shape. And I want to remind our uh, participants on the webinar that we've been monitoring your questions. I happy to say that many of them have been addressed sort of organically in the natural flow of conversation. But there have been several about climate change and policy at both the World Bank and the IMF. Could you could each of you speak about what each of the institutions uh, has in terms of climate change policy and what actually member countries need? And, and maybe this is outside the norms of traditional lending. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first on the on the World Bank. Um, climate change obviously um, is a, a, a priority for the Biden administration in the way it was not for its predecessor ad administration, um, the, the the Trump administration. And we, so we had a really interesting case of um, a, a World Bank um, president, David Malpass, um, hmm. uh, appointed under the Trump administration, who found himself very much at odds with a, a, a new administration after the 2020 elections, and um, he he resigned his uh, position in acknowledgement of those um, uh, differences. The new um, uh, president Ajay Banga has put um, uh, enormous um, emphasis on addressing um, climate change. Um, and my personal view is that the World Bank is exactly the right place to do this, um, mm -hmm. because without that emphasis, the development we all want to see in the poorer parts of the world is going to be extremely unfriendly to the climate that we all have to um, uh, live in. So I think that's this that's the most appropriate place we could possibly be emphasizing climate friendly financing right now. Well, I, and I would add to that that uh, the uh, the IMF has tried to really get into this game of uh, um, helping countries boost climate finance. Uh, it came up with uh, what is called the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which was set up um, a few years ago, uh, with the aim of uh, helping countries address those long-term structural challenges and that are related to climate change. Um, it has been a very popular instrument. Uh, tens of countries, uh, more than I think 40, 50 countries actually came up and tried to ask for it. Um, including many from Africa. So the question, of course, is um, the IMF is facing those questions about to what extent it should be uh, involved in this game. Uh, but I think uh, what they have been saying, and which makes sense, is there is a role for the IMF to play 
um, you know, in um, fighting climate change when certainly it is macro critical. And uh, when doing so, when they say macro critical is when it has really an impact on the stability, uh, macroeconomic stability of the country and the, also the external stability of the country. But what matters is really if the IMF has to be involved in that, how really the IMF can do it in a very close collaboration with uh, con um, organizations that have the expertise like the World Bank. And I think this is critical. And certainly this is something that uh, really needs to, uh, to be uh, taken a look at because the IMF is going to have a first review of this uh, RST in the coming month. I think this is hopefully something that they will come out of it to make it much more sort of thing, um, more in align with the needs and the expectations of uh, members, but more importantly, also very effective in helping the world address climate change. And one last thing I would say that out there also is I think beyond climate change, which is extremely critical because it's an existential threat, there are also other uh, public goods that the World Bank and the IMF can help address. Whether we are talking about fragility, uh, many countries are in conflict, uh, they need support. Unfortunately, they're not getting it all the time, and which means that, of course, they have little resources left for addressing climate change or some other sort of challenges they're facing. Whether we are talking also about food security, it's a big issue also in many countries, in many parts of Africa or around the world also. That's a, an issue where the World Bank has come some clear expertise and also the IMF came up with a new instrument to help countries address food security uh, sort of issues, although there is uh, some, some, some room for improvement uh, when it comes to those type of instruments. So those are issues that, of course, global challenges that the world are facing, that the IMF and the World Bank can play a role, but they need to be really uh, sort of reformed the way that uh, would really help uh, improve their effectiveness in addressing those issues. And maybe just for a, a, a sort of a deadline type question, one of our participants has asked if, because the uh, the UN Summit of the Future in September at the General Assembly has put on the agenda uh, governance reform at these institutions, do we think we'll see something before the General Assembly in September, or is that kind of arbitrary? Possibly. I think where I would uh, really have some expectation in uh, hopefully something getting done is at the G20 with um, with Brazil now um, um, assuming the presidency and, of course, placing this issue about the reform of the international um, uh, economic system uh, high on the agenda. Um, uh, I know that um, they have been and they are going to be also having some uh, a series of meetings at the ministry level, at the governor of the central bank level, but also at the uh, you know head of state level later this year uh, in Brazil. Uh, this is a continuous agenda that the G20 has been um, sort of doing. There has been some uh, reform that are underway. Maybe the issue is unfortunately it has not been fast enough or ambitious enough, but uh, let's hope that now uh, with Brazil taking this over, hopefully uh, we will get some uh, good news, uh, hopefully soon, but it, uh, it they cannot do anything so long as the US, the European countries, and of course, other uh, BRICS also are very much fully on board, uh, which is very much critical. And Dr. Steele, any final points from you? And then I want to be sure to turn it over to Courtney. Yeah, uh, one, one area of governance reform that uh, is is controversial in this country, but I don't think sh should be, is the question of who heads the IMF and the, mm -hmm. the World Bank. Mm -hmm. um, uh, going back to um, uh, 1946, it was the intention of the Truman administration to put uh, an American uh, atop the IMF. It was probably, we don't have definitive uh, evidence of this, but probably their intention to take the World Bank as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the way we wound up with an American atop the World Bank and a, and a European atop the, um, the, the IMF is very strange indeed. Um, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI um, director, when he found out that um, Harry Truman was planning to make um, uh, Harry Dexter White from the U.S. Treasury um, the uh, head of the uh, IMF, um, produced a long memo for the president arguing that he should not even consider it because um, well, White was a, a major Soviet asset. Um, it turns out he didn't know a fraction of it. 
white was indeed um, uh, a very significant Soviet asset. If not, probably not technically an agent, he wasn't taking orders from um, Moscow, um, but he was um, definitely crossing the line in terms of passing secret information, advocating for them in policy debates, uh, protecting others who had been rightly accused of being Soviet agents, etc. So a Truman who didn't um, uh, trust Hoover um, uh, decided to try to brush this under the um, carpet by telling the Europeans that they could have the um, uh, IMF. Truman didn't want to raise any questions by trying to put another American above white because that would raise all sorts of questions he didn't want to deal with about why white was being passed over since white had effectively created both institutions. Um, and the US wound up taking the, the World Bank, which was really a consolation prize. So that was just Truman's effort to cover up a spy scandal. But fast forward to today, and we view this somehow as the American birthright um, to, to run the World Bank and the Europeans for reasons nobody seems to know run the um, uh, IMF. I would argue it would be to our strategic advantage for both parties to give up um, uh, this privilege from the perspective of the, the um, United States. It doesn't do us any good when you have a, a, a World Bank president who's been appointed by one administration, then having to serve another administration that has an entirely different uh, agenda. That's first of all. Second of all, it doesn't threaten the US um, uh, veto, which is ultimately what really matters in terms of governance of the institutions. Third, if the Europeans had to give up um, uh, their birthright um, to head the IMF, it would actually give the US more influence over who would um, head the um, organization. And the IMF has traditionally been considered more important to the um, uh, global finance and monetary system than the uh, World Bank. So for, for all these reasons, and in particular, um, uh, to aid the United States in competition with China, by bringing the rest of the world on board. I think it's time for both the Americans and the Europeans to give up this um, uh, uh, birthright to head the two institutions. I'd be interested to hear what Dowd has to say about that. No, I fully agree with you. Ben. I think this is a really, um, that would very much help to have um, a more transparent uh, selection of the IMF uh, managing director and also the World Bank um, president. Of course, um, uh, you, if you ask that, uh, they would tell you it's already the case. But at the end of the day, the, um, the reality is since uh, the 80 years ago, when since the, the two organizations have been uh, um, sort of found it is only uh, an American leading the World Bank and uh, a European leading the uh, IMF. And um, I, I think I fully associate with the argument that you made. And any sort of reform that can really give more credibility to these institutions is very much critical for their sustainability and their viability. Otherwise, what happened is what we are seeing now, um, the AAIB that uh, Ben talked about has now over 100 um, uh, members, including 22 from Africa. I think those countries are also trying to see what are those good alternatives that they can get. And any reform that can really sort of uh, reassure them uh, is something that uh, would be very much welcome. It's not to say that uh, you know uh, we should not create additional um, sort of uh, institution because uh, the needs is uh, the the demand is extremely high. But I think uh, if you want to save, and I think we all do want that, is to save the IMF and the World Bank so that they continue to play the important role they they meant to play. You need you need to readapt them and modernize them to make sure that they are up to fit and uh, you know uh, um, yeah, uh, consistent with the requirement at the twenty first century. Well, on those constructive comments, I want to thank you both for simulating conversation. As I said at the beginning, I feel that we could use a second hour. I hope we might dedicate some time to a book discussion and an article discussion because you've both written so much. Uh, but I'll turn it over to Courtney to wrap up. All right. Thank you. I just want to echo what you said, James. Uh, thank you so much for moderating and bringing your expertise in. And Dr. Steele, Dr. Semben, this was fascinating. Thank you both so much um, for, for the work that you do and for being with us today. Just a few quick housekeeping notes because I know we're at time. Uh, we do have some events coming up and um, the big one is our gala. So that is in 20 days from now, that is in New York. So if you're in New York, please do attend. Uh, we will be 
hearing from Mike Froman, who is the Michael Froman, who is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and who will be in conversation with um, Lindsay Howard, who is um, a, a senior foreign policy analyst at Bloomberg. Um, we have a great evening with Ishan Tharoor of the Washington Post and um, Shoshana Stewart, who runs Turquoise Mountain. So a lot of great people should be a great event. Please do come if you're in the city. Um, and we will be focusing our attention on that. But in the meantime, we do have a few more events that we're working on, including um, one about humanitarian aid to Gaza and the challenge they're in. And that will be on Tuesday, April 16th. And this is free and open to everyone around the world. So thank you. Um, oh, and we have an upcoming member only briefing as well um, on Australia and, and whether it is the new superpower of the South. So with that, thank you all. Um, really appreciate it and have a wonderful day, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.